Have you ever looked at a recipe and thought, this looks so good, but there's no way I can eat it because these carbs are way too high. Or maybe you have a favorite recipe. Maybe it's been passed down from your grandmother to your mother to you, and you think you're just going to have to tuck that away in a drawer somewhere because you're never going to be able to eat it because those carbs are way out of your range. Well, before you toss that recipe to the side, listen up here because I'm going to give you some tips and tricks on how to change any high carb baked good recipe into a low carb treat. And if you're new to my channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button and hit the little notification bell. That way you could be notified every time I put out a new video. And while you do that, let's get to it. The first and probably one of the most important things that you have to figure out when you're changing a high carb recipe to a low carb recipe is what type of flour should you use? There's a lot of different flours out there, but it's important to find which one is going to be just right to make your low carb recipe turn out great. The flour is what sets the taste and the texture of your baked good. You get the wrong flour, your baked good is turn, gonna turn into this crumbly mess. You get the right flour and it's wonderful. There are three types of flours that I have found the most success with in my baking adventure. And those are nut and seed flours, bean flour such as garbanzo flour, and coconut flour. These three flours I personally have found the most success with. However, you cannot just take any one of these flours and substitute it out one cup of white flour for one cup of one of these flours. You cannot just substitute them out one for one. Each one has to be looked at individually and each one has to be adjusted in its own way. Now nut and seed flours to me are the easiest to work with when you're first starting and first learning how to change a high carb recipe into a low carb recipe. Nut and seed flours such as almond flour and pumpkin seed flours, which are my two favorites, you can swap them out one for one for white or wheat flour. However, you do have to adjust the liquid ratios, which we will get to that in a little bit later part of this video. But for now, just know that if you are wanting to substitute out one cup of white or wheat flour, you can substitute it out for one cup of almond flour or pumpkin seed flour and you will have a great tasting baked good. What I like to do is I like to use a combination of the both and throw in some vital wheat gluten. We'll talk a little bit more about that also, but I like to combine a third cup of almond flour with a third cup of pumpkin seed flour and a third cup of vital wheat gluten flour. Put those together and it will equal one cup of white or wheat flour. Combining the flours all together helps neutralize the flavor. If you're just using straight almond flour or straight pumpkin seed flour, then your baked good can have an overpowering taste of almond or overpowering taste of pumpkin seeds. And you don't really want that if you're wanting it to be close to the traditional flavor and taste that you're used to. So by combining the flours together, it helps to neutralize those flavors where they blend together and make that perfect texture and that perfect taste where it's going to come pretty darn close to your original recipe. When it comes to bean flours, garbanzo or chickpea flour is my favorite. There's a lot of different bean flours out there, but I find that garbanzo and chickpea flour has a fairly mild taste when it comes to a bean flour. However, if you choose to use garbanzo or chickpea flour, do not use it by itself. If you try to substitute one cup of white flour for one cup of garbanzo flour, you are gonna have a very, very strong chickpea taste to your cakes or your cookies or your breads. And you don't really want that, especially if it's a cookie or cake recipe. Your cookie or cake recipe will end up tasting more like a sweet chickpea if all you used was bean flour. 
However, bean flour is great to mix in with other gluten-free flours because it gives it more of a texture that's similar to white or wheat flour. Garbanzo flour has a similar texture to white flour if you're just picking it up and filling it. And then when you combine it with almond flour or pumpkin seed flour and vital wheat gluten, it gives a really great texture that is really close to white or wheat flour. And then when you combine the other flours with that chickpea or garbanzo flour, it neutralizes its taste so that your baked good isn't going to taste like a sweet chickpea. It's going to have a combination of flours and so it's going to have a better taste, a more full rich texture, and it's going to be a lot more similar to the original recipe that you're used to. So if you do choose to use garbanzo flour as a combination with other flours, then use no more than one third the amount of flour that the original recipe calls for. So if the original recipe calls for one cup of flour, then only use one third cup of garbanzo or chickpea flour and use the other two thirds cup as a combination of almond flour or pumpkin seed flour or vital wheat gluten. Use a combination there. That way they'll all neutralize each other out and it'll give you a good taste and a good texture. And the third favorite flour that I use is coconut flour. Coconut flour, in my opinion, is one of the hardest flours to try to trade out with a white or wheat flour. I mean, it makes for a great baked good, but it is really hard because you have to get the flour to liquid ratio just right, or you're gonna end up with a dense, dry baked good that turns pasty in your mouth and no one wants that. So coconut flour is not something that I advise you start right out with because it is harder to try to transfer it. Once you get the idea down, it'll be fine and you can do it. But for starters, it can be a little bit more difficult. But if you do choose to use coconut flour, keep in mind, a little coconut flour goes a long way. If your original recipe calls for one cup of white or wheat flour, only substitute one third the amount of coconut flour. So if it's one cup of white or wheat flour, all you need to use is one third cup of coconut flour. You do not need to add any other flours with it to create the bulk because coconut flour absorbs moisture. So when coconut flour comes in contact with the moisture that's in your recipe, it expands and creates bulk. So therefore, that third cup of coconut flour is going to expand to create the same amount of bulk as one cup of white or wheat flour will. In a little bit, we'll talk about that ratio of liquid to flour, but for now, just know that one third cup of coconut flour is the same as one cup of white or wheat flour. So for my personal experience, the easiest way to substitute out one cup of white or wheat flour is to simply straight sub it out for one cup of almond flour or one cup of pumpkin seed flour. You will have to adjust the liquids like I said, we'll talk about that in a minute, but the easiest way to do it when you're first starting out is one cup for one cup with almond or seed flour. However, if you're wanting the taste and the texture to be more close to white or wheat flour, it's best to use a combination of the gluten-free flours and throw in a little bit of vital wheat gluten to give that texture that white and wheat flour give. So if your recipe was to call for two cups of flour, you can use two thirds cup of almond flour, two thirds cup of pumpkin seed flour, and two thirds cup of vital wheat gluten, and you'd have a great combination that would give you a taste and texture very similar to white or wheat flour. Now, if you're wanting gluten free, no worries. You can still have great tasting baked goods. You don't have to have that vital wheat gluten in there to have a good texture. You can substitute out two cups of white or wheat flour for two thirds cup of almond flour, two thirds cup of oat or seed flour, and four to five tablespoons of coconut flour. And that'll give you a good combination that gives you a good starter for a good texture that will be very similar to white or wheat flour. So after you figure out the right flour or flour combination that you're gonna use, 
The next thing you need to figure out is a binding agent. Every flower has to have a binding agent. A binding agent is what is in a flower that helps keep the ingredients together. White and wheat flour both contain gluten. Gluten, when it comes in contact with the liquids that's in the ingredients, creates a gluey type substance that helps glue all of your ingredients together. So the finished baked good is fluffy and light and all in one piece. Gluten-free flours, however, like almond flour and pumpkin seed flour, do not contain gluten. So they do not have a binding agent, so you have to add a binding agent. You have to find something that acts the same way as gluten would. That when it comes in contact with liquids in, your, in the recipe, that it will create that same gummy, gooey texture and glue all of your ingredients together. If you do not add a binding agent to your gluten-free flours, your baked goods will fall apart. They will be crumbly and there's no, nothing there that can hold the texture together. So you have to have a binding agent. The three binding agents that I like to use are xanthan gum, psyllium husk, and vital wheat gluten. Those are my three go-tos. Xanthan gum is my favorite binding agent when I am doing a gluten-free recipe. But it's important to remember that a little bit of xanthan gum goes a long way. If you use too much xanthan gum, your baked good is going to turn into a gooey, globby mess and it's going to be disgusting. But if you use the right amount, it's going to glue it together and it's gonna turn out a wonderful baked good. The general rule when it comes to xanthan gum is to use a half teaspoon for every one cup of gluten-free flour. If the recipe contains yeast, then you need to up the xanthan gum to one teaspoon of xanthan gum for every cup of gluten-free flour. So, if your original recipe calls for two cups of white or wheat flour, then you can use two cups of almond flour or seed flour and add one teaspoon of xanthan gum if the recipe does not contain yeast, and if it does contain yeast, two teaspoons of xanthan gum for your binding agent. The next binding agent that I use is psyllium husk powder. Psyllium husk powder is not my favorite binding agent, only because it can require a lot of practice. It's not one that really easily flows in with the ingredients, but it does work. It works great. I use it in my tortilla recipes a lot. It works great for those. So it is a good alternative for gluten. In gluten-free baking, it does well for a binding agent. Again, with psyllium husk, a little bit goes a long way. The general rule is a half tablespoon of psyllium husk for every one cup of gluten-free flour, if it doesn't have yeast. If it has yeast, then up that psyllium husk powder to one tablespoon of psyllium husk powder for every one cup of gluten-free flour. So again, if your original recipe calls for two cups of white or wheat flour, then you can use one cup of almond flour, one cup of pumpkin seed flour, and one tablespoon of psyllium husk powder. If it's got yeast, bump it up to two tablespoons of psyllium husk powder. The third binding agent is Vital Wheat Gluten. This is my absolute favorite binding agent. Vital Wheat Gluten is made from wheat flour. It's basically wheat flour that has been rinsed and stripped of everything except for the pure gluten. So it doesn't have hardly any carbs and it doesn't affect your blood sugar the way white or wheat flour would. But when you add it into your recipe, it gives it that texture and that taste of white or wheat flour that we're used to having in your original recipe. So it is my go-to, if I am not doing a gluten-free recipe, it is my go-to binding agent. I absolutely love it. If you've seen any of my videos, you know I use Vital Wheat Gluten all the time. Like I said, for people who are on a gluten-free diet, and uh, have wheat allergies, gluten sensitivities, of course you can't use vital wheat gluten, but you can still have successful 
baking with the xanthan gum or the psyllium husk for your binding agent. For those of us who do use vital wheat gluten, because it is made from wheat flour, you have to treat it almost like it's a flour. So if you're substituting it in, you only need to use it for a third of the amount of flour that the original recipe calls for. So again, if your recipe calls for two cups of whiter wheat flour, you can use two thirds cup almond flour, two thirds cup pumpkin oat or seed flour, and two thirds cup of vital wheat gluten. This will give you an excellent combination and this will give you an excellent texture and taste and flavor that will be so close to the original recipe that people might not even be able to tell the difference. It's, it makes a wonderful combination with that vital wheat gluten. I absolutely love it. Now, if you want some more information on these three binding agents and what exactly they are and when exactly it's best to use them, then check out my video on low carb diet, how to bake with low carb flours, or go to my website, janetsdeliciouslowcarbkitchen.com and check out the article on secret to baking with low carb flours. This can give you some more information on these binding agents and let you know when it's best to use them. Now we've learned what type of flour to use and how to substitute it out. We've learned about the binding agents and which is best to use and how to use them in your recipe. Now we need to find a rising agent. The gluten that is in white and wheat flour not only helps with that binding agent that we talked about, but it also helps with the rising process. Gluten helps your dough to be nice and stretchy, so that way when you incorporate it in with all the other ingredients, it helps your ba baked good to rise. It helps your cookies to not look like a flat pancake, but to have that little puff to them that we like. It helps your cakes not look like a brick, but to get that light fluffy texture. So that gluten not only helps with binding, but it helps with the rising process. So when we are substituting in gluten-free flours, we have to find a rising agent that's going to act just like that gluten and help our baked goods get nice and fluffy. Most traditional baking recipes call for baking soda or baking powder. Anytime you're looking at your original recipe and it calls for baking soda or baking powder, always use double acting baking powder. Baking powder is a combination of baking soda and the acid agent such as cream of tartar that helps that baking soda to become active so it can help your dough to rise. Double acting baking powder acts in two stages. The first one is at room temperature while you're mixing the dough. It's activating, it's helping to make that dough stretch a little bit more. And then the second and most of the activation process is while it's baking. The gases are released and it helps your dough to have that nice fluffy rise. So the double acting baking powder helps give those low carbs flours that extra little boost that it needs. When using baking powder in your low carb flours, you're going to need to increase the amount of baking powder that your original recipe calls for. And you're going to need to increase it by about 25%. So what I do is I multiply whatever the amount of the original recipe calls for baking soda or baking powder, I multiply that by 1.25, which is 25%, and it will give me the amount that I need. So if my original recipe calls for one teaspoon of baking soda or baking powder, I multiply one by 1.25, which of course is gonna be 1.25, and so I know I'm going to need one and a quarter teaspoon in my low carb recipe. When using yeast as a rising agent for your breads or your rolls, whatever you need it for, you can generally keep it about the same. I like to use instant yeast because you it doesn't uh, take any proofing process. With instant yeast, you can just throw it at, right in with your dry ingredients, mix it in, and then let it go through the rising process after everything's all put together. So you don't have to worry about proofing it before you put it into your recipe. 
Generally, when I use instant yeast in my breads, I use quite a bit more than what a traditional recipe would call for. Like for example, when you're just making a traditional white loaf of bread, most of the time it'll call for one and a half to two teaspoons of active dry yeast. If you've seen my recipe on fluffy low carb bread, it calls for two tablespoons of instant yeast. This sounds like a lot, but I use this much because the yeast in a low carb recipe not only acts as a binding agent, but it is for taste. When we taste those white and wheat breads that everybody loves, a lot of the taste that you are tasting is yeast. And so in a low carb recipe, if you increase the instant yeast, it's going to not only help you give that extra rise, but it's also going to give you a taste that's going to taste like traditional bread. So it's not just for a rising agent, it's also for taste. So we're gonna stop with that today. There's a lot of information right there. I'm gonna let you digest that all. There's gonna be a part two coming up to give you some more information on how to change your high carb recipes into low carb treats. And as always, keep cooking.